This is episode 55 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Viado. I am very excited about sharing today's conversation with you. I had the great privilege and honor of speaking with two incredible women on a topic that I would say for maybe not all, but most of us is very difficult to navigate, evokes fear, it's uncomfortable, and that is the experience of being a caregiver for someone at the end of life. And I want to emphasize that You do not have to currently be a caregiver for someone who is dying to benefit from this episode. The insights and wisdom that these ladies share are a gift to the living as well. Today there are more than 40 million unpaid caregivers in the U.S. People like you and me who've taken on the task of helping a family member or friend in their last stage of life. And barring the experience of a sudden death, most of us will need end-of-life care as well. The knowledge, compassion, skill, and insights we can bring to this stage of life can mean the difference between a bad death or a good death, which also impacts the grieving process that occurs after the loved one passes. My guests today are Katie Orlip and Yana Beecham, authors of the book, Living with Dying, a complete guide for caregivers. This book is a comprehensive field guide for those caring for a loved one at the end of life. It is straightforward and easy to use, offers tangible, fact-driven advice for overwhelmed caregivers juggling full-time jobs and their own lives. The book, which has been reviewed by oncologists, hospice doctors, and nurses, instructs readers on how to have the conversation about end-of-life wishes and concerns and navigate the emotional and spiritual journey with their loved ones. The book offers clear instructions for giving the best care possible, including how to control pain, address symptoms, and understand the dying process. Katie Orlip is the co-author of Spiritual Tools for the Dying. She received her nursing degree from Santa Barbara City College and a bachelor's in psychology and master's of social work at SUNY Albany. She has been a social worker for Asante Hospice for 25 years. Yana Beecham recently edited National Geographic's Science Encyclopedia 2016 and was a contributing editor for National Geographic's The Ultimate Explorer Field Guide, Birds 2015. Under the pen name Yana N. Malcolm, she has written more than 130 books for juveniles and young adults for Scholastic, Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, and more. Hi, Katie and Yana, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Lourdes. Great to be here. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, I am so... Just when I saw the title of this book and what it was about, I just I just knew I wanted to have you on the podcast to have this conversation because it's a difficult conversation and a necessary conversation. So thank you so much for creating this resource and for being here today. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Yeah. So I just wanted to start with, um, you know, so I'm always curious about, you know, where ideas and creations you know, come from. And I wanted to ask, first of all, you know, what compelled the two of you to write this book? Well, it's funny. Katie and I have been friends for about 20 years, and then I uh, moved next door to her. And when I became her neighbor, she would come home from work as quite often and tell me that she'd say, today was a really good death. And I, of course, wanted to know what a good death was because we all want to have a good death. So I would pump her for all the details. And Katie's, so the more I found out about Katie's job as a hospice social worker, the, you know, the more interest I had. And so Katie started telling me that she wished that 
the information she was giving to me was in a book because she gives it to everybody daily. So I, at the time, I've, I've, I suggested we uh, write it together. I, I'm an author and have been for 30 years, and so it was a perfect partnership. Then when my father, who had uh, prostate cancer, was diagnosed, was told he, his prostate cancer had metastasized to his bones, he was put on hospice. And Katie became a social worker, hospice social worker, and our journey began. So the book chronicles my journey with my father and all the information that Katie has always wanted to offer. Right, Katie? Yeah, I always felt there needed to be a no-nonsense, bullet-pointed, you know, with boxes, very easy-to-use handbook for caregivers who are taking care of loved ones at the end of life and, and just, you know, educate them, support them through the last months, weeks, and days, and even hours of life and what to expect, what to look for. Because I, I've found over my years of working that that caregivers, there's a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety around dying, and there, there's a big mystery. And I think the more we learn about something, the more comfortable we, we become, the anxiety is decreased, and that allows time for a really good quality with the person who's going to be dying so that this precious time is used for positive interactions and just really decreasing the fear and the anxiety around dying. You know, that I loved how you said that, um, you know, there's so much mystery around this process and this experience. And I think that when we, we don't understand something and we are afraid of it, it, it gets very difficult to, to know how to move forward and to understand what is coming up for you. And, you know, that question of, am I doing this right? You know, yes. and yeah. That was the best part of the whole, my father, my father was on the hospice for six months and since Katie and I start, t started talking about, you know, what caregivers need to know, what families need to know, what patients need to know. So we, our book really chronicles the six-month journey, but it, it followed what happens to the body, what happens to the mind, what happens to the people around the person who's ill, what happens to the caregiver. And it was it was really comforting I, to know that there actually really is a way that the body dies and it's it's a normal way and a lot of the things that happen that are you know to the body are, are seem kind of scary if you're a caregiver and what, if you know what that it's a natural event that's happening it's it's it really takes all the fear away. Yeah, in one of the chapters we talk about the labor of dying and it's and we compare it to the labor of birth. Uh, there's a labor with being born, and there's a labor the body goes through when it's dying. And I think by normalizing it and outlining the labor, the stages of the labor, that um, families and even the patients understand that this is normal. It's not a medical emergency. They don't need to be hospitalized. There are medications and other ways to relieve the symptoms. And so it becomes a natural event. And you know, we try to focus on the sacredness of it try to, we also emphasize the emotional, spiritual aspects of dying because sometimes that they're, they're pushed to the side and I feel that they are just as important as the physical aspects of dying. Could you speak to what the stages in the labor of dying are? Well, we talk about there being transitional labor and then active labor at the very end. Uh -huh. But at the beginning, uh, we talked, it was... Uh, first of all, the person starts to withdraw from the world, wouldn't you say, Katie? That this may be months before they die. And of course, this is all general, but usually months before the person dies, there is a withdrawal from life and their circle becomes smaller and smaller. They may stop watching television and listening to the news, start napping more, usually eating decreases as their body is beginning to shut down. And they start withdrawing a little bit, not talking as much. There's a fatigue. There's a decrease in appetite. And the appetite, that was part of the reason we started. One of the big subjects we wanted to cover in the book is quite often caregivers think they're really doing a great job if they can get their patient to eat. <laughs> and there, there's a reason why people stop eating. Their body can't digest the food anymore. So, so you, we shouldn't force food on people. And, and don't the food's... In, decrease, don't they, Katie? Yeah, and, you know, our culture, many people, we equate, you know, feeding and cooking and food with love. And I think we need to just change that thinking when someone is dying. 
as they get closer to dying in the last few weeks, there may be a little bit of confusion. Again, they, they sleep more and more. They may start talking about seeing people or having dreams about people who have died already. And you kind of get the sense that they're, they have one foot in both worlds. And, um, and then, of course, there's active labor, which is in the final days and hours, where the body goes through a physical process of shutting down. They stop eating completely and can no longer swallow. So we um, emphasize and teach really good mouth care and oral care. And um, there can be an outburst of agitation or uh, this energy outburst close to when they die. It's almost like their last hurrah. And then the body you know, changes colors. There could be some dusky coloring in, their, in the extremities. It might develop fevers. There could be some difficulty breathing or labored breathing, uh, which is a sign that the death is getting pretty close. And, and then again, we have medications that work really well to ease these symptoms. So in our book, we do outline these stages and, and so people understand what is happening. But we also have suggestions on what to do. You know, um, if someone doesn't want to eat, what do you do? What can I feed them that they might like? What if they can't swallow? How do I keep their mouth moist? So we have a lot of really practical tips on how to um, provide care in each of these stages. K Katie was saying, you know, that we all think that the best uh, liquid to give somebody when they're they can't swallow is a, like a water, but it's actually the opposite. It's a more of a pudding well, is easier for a patient to swallow. They they also start talking in travel metaphors. Both our both our fathers did this. My father started talking about, I have to go. I have to. I've got to get my plane off the ground. He was a lifetime pilot. I have to. I have to get the passengers on the on board. I don't know how I'm going to fit everybody in the plane. And Katie's father had a. A, another metaphor. Yeah, my father loved watching ships. He lived on the ocean and he would be out on his balcony with his binoculars watching the ships go back and forth. And my two sisters and I were with him when he was dying at home. And a day or two before he died, he, he was starting to talk about having to get on a ship. And then he said to mm. me, hey, Katie, I don't know how I'm going to navigate the ship. I don't think I can navigate it anymore. And so I said, Dad, I'll navigate it for you. And I'll, I'll get you there. I'll get you to where you're going. And that, and he, he, he instantly calm down. So, and some of my patients talk, they say similar things like, oh, I have to catch the train. I have to pack my bags. They're coming for me. Um, one of my patients last week said to her son, and she had dementia and she hadn't been talking clearly for years, but she was able to clearly say to him, it's because I love you that I have to tell you I need to go. Oh, wow. He, she said it so clearly. And he says, he said, I think she's dying soon. And she died about a week later. Also, um, people start to see people. My father, about two weeks before he died, there was he started talking to someone over his left shoulder. And he'd cover his mouth and whisper, and then he'd listen, and then he'd giggle, and then he'd say some more things. And, and he'd, or we'd be talking, and he'd look, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Harvey with Jimmy Stewart, the rabbit, he, he would look up to him and respond like, They'd have, like mm. they were sharing a look with each other. And just before he died, he, had, he said to me, is he still there? And I said, yeah, yeah, he's there. And he goes, good, good. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I can see how, um, you know, everything you're sharing, it just really helps the person who is, um, you know, attending to their loved one to, to just have a, a framework for making sense of what's happening to address you know, the, the fears coming up. And I think also like, you know, with the example you gave about, you know, feeding them, I think, you know, for caregivers, you know, there's this idea that feeding them also cares for them and is helping them and to not feed them, I'm somehow, you know, not, not caring for them. And, yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's some, I, I've heard that uh, shared with me and I know that that has happened. And, and it's just now, but I didn't, I didn't know that till you told me right now what that was about. Yeah, because people say often say to me, well, what happens when he or she stops eating? What happens when they stop drinking? I don't want them to die of starvation. I don't want them to, you know, get, get dehydrated. So I have to reframe the whole process and, and explain that when, so, when the body is dying, the body cannot di digest food anymore. That's how our bodies die. This is a natural process. And that to force food into someone at this point causes more harm than good because usually they end up feeling bloated or nauseated. 
and as the body gets dehydrated, it releases endorphins. It really the the um, electrolytes become unbalanced, and it causes a natural sedation, which can even feel like a mild euphoria. So at the end of life, dehydration is a good thing. Um, the mm. important thing, as I've said, is to keep the mouth moist. There's there's you know stuff you could put in the mouth to keep it moist. There are swabs you can swab the mouth with. You can put tiny bits of ice chips in someone's mouth. So there are ways to keep them comfortable. But at this point, by forcing food or fluid in, you're really doing the body a lot more harm. So in your book, and you, you've mentioned that also today, you know, you talk about a good death. Can you share, you know, what is a good death and why is this, why does this matter? Well, with my hospice patients, when I first meet them, I ask them, what their wishes are, what are their hopes for the time they have left. And sometimes if they're able to talk about it, because not everyone can, I ask them what they imagine their death to be like or what kind of death they would like. And it's interesting because in, in our general society, when people are asked where they want to die, about 80 to 90% of people say they would like to die at home, uh, surrounded by loved ones. But sadly, only about 20% of people die at home. We need to do a much better job. But anyway, getting back to a good death, I think it's really dying on your own terms and mm -hmm. dying, you know, dying at home if that's where you want to be, being with the people you want, just having the surroundings the way you want, want them to be. But it's also living your last months, weeks, days the way you want, rather than going in and out of the hospital, going in and out of doctor's office, having unnecessary tests or procedures to focus on comfort and quality of life and being, you know, doing and being with the people that you want to be with. And I think that, you know, that's where hospice care comes in. Of course, I've been with hospice for 25 years. I'm a very strong advocate because most of our patients, when they're on hospice, they never see a hospital again. And we really try to help them with their goals. I have a patient now, she wants to go out to a rescue farm and she wants to sit and pet a horse. She loves horses mm -hmm. And that's her last wish is just to sit and love a horse. So I'm in the process of arranging for that to happen. And I love doing stuff like that. I mean, that's where it gets really creative, trying to help people do what they want to do and help just help make their, um, you know, help their wishes happen. Sometimes Katie's told me stories about people who've been struggling to, to stay here instead of go. And, and you've talked, Katie, about how sometimes you've helped them resolve some of their or a, address some of the things that are keeping them here, uh, unresolved problems with their families. and Yeah, and that's another big part of my work is, of course, you know, you, you talk about the authentic self. And I think that when you're facing death, you can't hide anymore. I mean, I mean, that's you're facing death and things come out that you've had buried down, deep down inside for years and years or things that you've tried to avoid. And uh, so a lot of stuff, as you can imagine, uh, surfaces toward the end of life, you know, relationships, problems that haven't been resolved, um, feelings of guilt or, you know, regret. Uh, so that's also a big part of what this time of life is for. It's to heal. It's a big time of healing. And again, it's very individual. I don't push people into doing something they're not ready for. And of course, there are plenty of things that, that we can't heal in this lifetime. But um, I do find that it is a really rich time for people to, to heal and to really be who they truly are and allow themselves to truly be loved. Because as you imagine, too, I meet people who have been wounded throughout their lives and maybe they've never really let someone love them. And sometimes at this time in their life, they're able to, to feel love for the first time. So it's when you have a loved one who maybe is um, experiencing these unresolved issues that are coming up, how can loved ones support them with that? You know, what is... How do you navigate that? Well, it, it starts with just listening. I, I, I just think that listening is one of the best things we all can do. And when I go into a home, I try not to go in with any agenda. I just sit and start listening. And maybe I, I, I ask a few questions, but I really want to hear where they're at at that moment. And sometimes things come up that the patient shares with me because because I haven't been part of their life. And I'm I'm there just to really accept them from who they are, for who they are with unconditional love and acceptance. And then I may talk with the family and that things come up with them. So I just try to find a way to bridge, to bridge them together. 
and um, Ira Bayak, who wrote a book called The Four Things. He's written many books. He's a, he's a wonderful um, physician who's worked for hospice and palliative care his whole life. He said the four important things that we need to convey uh, before we die is forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. And I had a patient once who had been pretty abusive to her kids, and they were, they were estranged. And as it got close to her death, um, they were going to come see her. And she was very frantic and didn't know how she was going to uh, be with them. So I took a yellow sticky and I simply wrote those four things down. Forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. And she ended up writing them each a card, incorporating uh, these four things into her message. And her kids came and they stayed for a few days. And although the visit was tense, she was able to give them these cards and it really softened up the atmosphere. And they were able to come to some some reconciliation. And, and so sometimes it's not complicated. Sometimes it's just yeah. a few simple statements. I mean, forgiveness is a huge thing. And we all, you know, we all struggle with forgiveness throughout our lives. And so that's something it, it's, it just takes, I think, a lot of listening and just, just offering people, people simple, just simple things they can do. Yeah. The biggest, one of the biggest lessons I've learned from Katie is that when she comes, I'm taking care of my 93-year-old mom right now. So pretty much my mother's, she's getting demented. She's, you know, cranky. She feels like she's in the way. And so Katie always looks like, or makes sure my mother knows that she has time for her. So she, she sits down. She never stands and talks to my mom. She always sits. And not only does she sit, she doesn't sit in a chair across the room. She pulls a chair right up next to my mom's chair, and sometimes she'll sit on my mom's walker and talk to her. But that's, that is a giant lesson that I've learned, because it, just sitting there means I have time for you, I'm ready to listen, and um, the listening aspect that Katie mentioned is it's really difficult, but I, I, think it, I think it actually works if you just sit there and... Yeah, it's very hard to sit with someone who's suffering and someone who's in pain. You know, I'm talking more about emotional pain. Um, it's yeah. a very hard thing to do, but I, but I mean, to me, that's probably one of the most important things that I do in my work. Uh, when people are feeling great, it's not hard to be around them, but I, I walk into situations where there is, there is pain. And, but I think by, by allowing someone what they're feeling, just simply being there and just, you know, recognizing that they're hurting will help them move out of that place because they, th their feelings need to be validated. And I think all the feelings we have, whether it's fear, anxiety, as well as joy at the end of life, I see a lot of joy. I think all of these feelings need to be acknowledged and need to be normalized, and, um, and especially feelings of anger, that, that it's normal. And I find that when people are allowed to express them and to work them through, they're able to move through them into a place of, you know, of, of healing and a place of peace. You know, Katie, as you were speaking, I was thinking about how, you know, as a, as a therapist, how, um, you know, we do a lot of work around helping people to understand and work with their emotions and to, to give themselves permission to feel and to give others permission to feel. And that acknowledgement and that space that's created, it sounds so simple, but there's so much potential healing in that. And why would it be any different at the end of life, you know? Right. I think we forget that. Just, you know, they, they have the same needs as we do at the beginning of life, at the middle of life, but we all need space for what we're feeling and acknowledgement and validation. And I think what I've learned too, and what Ira Bayek uh, wrote in his book, is that, that the di dying it's a great opportunity for growth and it's a stage of development. The end of life is a stage of development just as earlier stages are in our life. And they should be treated that way, that this is such a rich time to, to put down memories, to do life review, to write down, you know, ethical wills and um, give things to people you love. And it's just a rich time to give. And um, I tell my patients that I learned something from every one of them and sometimes difficult stuff, but I try to, to, people need purpose. And even someone who's dying, I think they need to feel that their lives still matter. And so I try, I just try to emphasize to them that they still matter and that we are learning from them, that they are, they are our teachers on how to do this. 
That's beautiful, Katie. Yeah, it's so beautiful to to be able to to look at this part of life, like you said, as a it's a stage of development. It's a rich time, and they're they have so much to offer to us at this time. Yeah, I was yesterday. I, I was with a patient who's in her nineties, and I just sat at the kitchen table with her and her granddaughter, and she started talking all about her growing up years. Um, you know, just during the depression, how they had a loaf of bread to last for a few days. And, you know, we were talking about uh, just what, what she went through, how she saw, you know, she went through all these different wars and her granddaughter was just there fascinated. And I was, I was watching her granddaughter and I said, you didn't know all this, did you? And she said, no. <laughs> she said, no. And uh, so they're, they're going to have a friend come out and start recording some of her stories. Yeah. Because here this 90 year old is just, and she talked for an hour without stopping. She was just, she was on fire. And I, it was just really, really a, just fun to sit and watch both of them. So I want to shift gears just a little bit and look at some of the, I guess, like more of the the practical mm-hmm. questions that might come up um, when a caregiver is um, grappling with this stage of life for their loved one. And I wanted you to speak a little bit more about advanced directives and the dementia clause. Oh, okay. I'll start with the advanced directive, but Katie can fill you in on the <laughs> dementia clause. The the advanced directive lets people know most all the states in the country have the advanced directive. The most popular one is called the five wishes document. And it, it basically lets uh, your relatives know or, or, or a specific caregiver know how you want to spend the last days of your life, what kind of pain medications you want, what kind of extreme Actions do you want taken? Do you want a feeding tube? Would you want life support? Would you want artificial hydration? If it looked like it probably wasn't going to prolong your life, so these are all uh, these documents are are really important. We should all fill them out, and not wait till till the end. We should all be doing it right now because what happens is if you don't fill out the advance directive and you don't appoint a health care representative to make sure that your wishes are followed when you're not, no longer able to speak for yourself, then you can end up with this thing we call the battle at the bedside where you've got mm. all these relatives standing there and everybody wants to help and everybody wants to do something. And so there's arguments over putting people on life support and putting people, you know, doing really things they shouldn't do that really harm the patient. And and it's good for your family to know what you want. Also, Katie was saying, it's also good to share it with your family that you filled out a directive, advanced directive, because sometimes they don't know it. And they same thing, the battle <laughs> starts again mm-hmm. of the dementia clause. Well, the dementia provision has been added after the, the advanced directive was um, established. The advanced directive only deals with being fed by a tube, if, you're un- if you can't speak for yourself and you're unable to swallow, would you want a feeding tube put in? And usually the situations are if you're close to death, if there's no chance you're going to recover. Um, they're usually pretty severe situations that you can document ahead of time if you would want feeding tubes. But it does not address would you want to be hand-fed if you had advanced dementia. Oftentimes when people are at the end stage of Alzheimer's or dementia, other kinds of dementia, They're unable to feed themselves. And most of the time now, at least out here, uh, feeding tubes are not put in people with advanced dementia anymore. It just really isn't recommended by physicians. But if they can't feed themselves, you know, would you, if you couldn't feed yourself and had advanced dementia, would you still want to be fed? Mm -hmm. Because because if, if you don't have that clause filled out and you're in a facility, they really have to keep feeding you, even if you're not doing that well with it, even though you're, you're, pocketing food in your cheek or you're starting to choke, they still feel they need to feed you even though it may not be the best thing. It, get, it can get very, it can, it can really raise ethical issues and some caregivers have a really hard time not feeding someone. Of course, comfort measures would be fully implicate, you know, would be fully used. But that's really important to document early on, especially if you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, how far you know, how far do you want the feeding to go if you're not, not able to um, take a nutrition yourself? Yep. And then what is the difference between palliative care and hospice care? Well, hospice care is a type of palliative care at the end of life. Hospice care is palliative care if you have approximately six months or less to live and you're no longer seeking aggressive or curative treatment. 
you basically want to focus on comfort, quality of life, don't want to go back into the hospital. Now, palliative care is much broader. Palliative care means comfort care. but You can have palliative care at any time in your disease process. So, for example, um, someone could have cancer and be receiving chemotherapy, but they're having lots of symptoms from the treatment. They could see a palliative care team and have those symptoms addressed, um, even though they're expected to get better. So palliative care, and most of the time palliative care is is provided in hospital or clinic settings with a team of palliative care um, specialists. Hospice care is provided mostly at home, although uh, hospice care can also be provided in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. What would you say are the the things you wish you had known before you were in the position of being a caregiver? Well, gosh, there's so much. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Three biggest ones. Okay, okay, we'll go with the three biggest. Okay, I'll start with, I wish I'd known how to take care of myself, which is kind of a weird thing to start with. But I, I when my father was, uh, in, he was in such pain when he got, uh, when he, his bone, when he got bone cancer, I was just frantic. So I became this lunatic running around driving, you know, madly from their house to the hospital and trying to take him to doctors and, and um, not eating and not, I can't, everything that made my life happy, I eliminated. I used to walk with my friend in the morning. I cut that out. I, I felt like I had absolutely no time. I, I, and I wasn't helping any. I just made my parents nervous. I mean, I'd get in there and panic about what was happening in their house and how he was being treated and all those things. And I just wish that I had understood that there's a phrase, if there's very little time, so go slowly, mm. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so wow. I wish I had learned to just go slow. <laughs> yes, because That's such a paradox, you know, because when you say there's very little time, it's like, well, then go faster, you know, but actually it's right. Wow. It's beautiful. It's like stop and smell the roses. You know, you have to yeah. take time. And I think when you're caring for someone who's dying, and I know that Yana would agree with her experience is that sometimes we, they, all they need us to do is just sit. And just be there. We don't have to be, always be running around doing things. Right. Yeah. I think that was it. I discovered, you know, when you assess really what their needs are, I, 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 my mom needed to be driven to the hairdresser. My father needed to have, you know, they needed to have food in their house. But really, basically, they just wanted someone to be there with them and, and care. And that's the part I kind of skipped. I was just frantically running everywhere, trying to make everything perfect. And um, I think part of that is cut yourself some slack. Forgive yourself. You're not perfect. And, and also, when I, had child- when I first had children, it, it took me a while to figure out that they actually took some time. You know, I, I, had, I had a lot of things that I would accomplish before I had children, and I thought that I could keep doing that and didn't realize that, well, you know, if I remove X amount of hours from my day, I'm not going to be able to accomplish all of that. And that's okay. I had to learn to accept that's okay, of course. And I, that was also what I learned, needed to learn to accept when, when I was caregiving for my dad and now caregiving for my mother. And I have to do it every day because I get, you know, I tell myself, take time, take a deep breath. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Breathing is important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there's other things, you know, I, I'm so glad that I had Katie as my Sherpa through his, my father's death <laughs> because I really would have um, panicked about everything. And because I, I knew what was coming, it was kind of a, it was a wondrous experience. So understanding what hap- that happens to the body is great. Oh, I also wished that I had asked for help. Or sooner, <laughs> sooner, you know, <sighs> friends come up to you and they go, are you okay? Is there something, anything I can do to help? No, 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 I'm fine. And in reality, yeah, they could have sat for an hour with my parents talking to them while I ran and got prescriptions or whatever. I, I wish that I had asked for them to pick up groceries for me. So, so what I learned was to keep a notebook and make that list, but I wish I'd known that ahead of time so that if you actually have a real list of your needs, 
when somebody asks you, you can offer them three alternatives and they'll do it because they want to help. We all want to help. That, yeah, I wish <laughs> I'd known that then. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I just, I'm just thinking to myself, you know, slow down, ask for help, <laughs> self-care. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are things that, you know, we, we should be doing them all the time. And why do we, at this sacred time and, and challenging time, do we really kind of let those go? You know, it's interesting. Yeah, I think our culture has a difficulty sometimes asking for help. And I think we yeah. need to, it's like it takes a village. And I, I think that people do want to help and we need to, we need to pull people in because it then becomes a shared experience. And, and when I do have situations, I do have patients sometimes where they have a huge network of friends and family and maybe people from the church, and there are constantly people coming in and out and helping. And everyone is everyone feels a sense of purpose. And I think it, everyone grows from this. People, people really benefit from giving. And I think sometimes in this culture, we, we're in such an insulated society sometimes that we don't reach out and help, nor do we let people help us. And I think we'd all be better off if we did that. Yeah, the, there are the statistics are kind of amazing. There are 60 million unpaid caregivers in the, this country, people who are taking care of a relative or a parent. And most of them are women. And so I, I can only imagine there are people trying to continue their work and add to their you know, day taking care of a relative or, or like I said, parents or a loved one in, in your house, a spouse. So it's it's a huge deal to learn how to take care of ourselves. Yeah. So in your book, and I think you you've you've talked about some of these already. You you mentioned some you know unexplained mysteries that often happen at the deathbed. Can you share a little bit more about that? Well, so, sometimes it's at the deathbed. Sometimes it's it's weeks before. But there's things happen that are pretty can be pretty amazing. Um, I had one patient who lived out in the woods and his house, he had a a, a porch that wrapped around his entire house. And when he started feeling ill, he started, you know, his dying process. He would sit in this big easy chair by a window. And, you know, as he was getting ill, sicker, a flock of wild peacocks started spending the day outside his window. During the day, they'd come over and sit right outside his window. And then at night, they'd go go back into the trees to, to roost. And so, and as he moved to other places in the house, they would find him. They would be sitting out on the deck outside whatever room he was in. When he got into the hospital bed, they would, they moved to that area and he had to go in, into the hospital briefly for a few days. And it was really interesting that when he was in the hospital, they didn't come, they didn't come for those days. And then when, Very interesting. Yeah, then when he returned oh. home and he was actively dying, he was going through the labor of you know, the last day of dying and during that period, they didn't, at night, they, they continued to stay outside his window during night, the night. They didn't go back up into the trees. They just stayed by his side. And then after his death, his wife said that they, they went away and they never came back. Wow. So that's just, that's just one pretty amazing story. You, you also talked about that woman who used to feed stray animals. Yeah, the animals really are very, animals really know what's going on. I mean, our, our patients that have cats and dogs, they show really very empathetic behavior, uh, like they know what's going on. But there was one woman who, she fed all the cats and dogs in the neighborhood, and she would put out food for them, and they'd they'd kind of come in and out, and sometimes she didn't see them for days, but she, you know, she was, that was a big, um, really important part of her life, and her relationships were with these animals. And when she was actively dying, a lot of these animals appeared, and they, and she had the door (gasps) open, and a lot of them came in, and they sat on her bed, as, 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 as if they knew, and they would just, they all just, of them. all of them, like a bunch, of them. a whole bunch of them came in and they were visiting her and they were staying with her. And another person, another story with birds showing up besides the peacocks, birds seem to, uh, seem mm. to appear a lot, flocks of birds. You know, uh, when my dad died, he was, we, ha- I had a baby monitor in the room and Katie and I had just been in there. And as we left the room, suddenly we heard all this static over the, monitor and Katie turned to me and said, well, he's gone. And wow. and yesterday we talked to a woman who said she was holding her father's hand when he died and she felt electric, uh, uh, elect- like electric shock go 
from his hand to her hand move up her arm what, when he died. Yeah, like an electric current. Yeah. Oh, this is just, a, you know, this is a, a conversation that is just, you know, so, um, so moving there. I mean, between the practical how-tos, you know, and then just the, like, what you're describing, the mysteries and the, the depth and the richness um, at this time, you know, I, I can just, you know, I am just so grateful that the two of you collaborated and, and created this resource. It's so needed. It is. And, and in the center of our book, we have a caregiver manual that we, we explain things like how to turn someone in bed, how to position somebody, how to give a bed bath with, you know, with illustrations. So we, we, we discuss the spiritual and emotional and the grief and the dying process, but, but we also have a very practical guide on hands-on care and how to diaper somebody in bed. And so we think we've included just about everything, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the beauty is it's about 200 pages long. So it's, a, it's, it's truly a manual, a lot of bullet points, little like shaded boxes, very easy to read, not too complicated so that when someone's in the thick of it, when they're in the trenches caring for someone, they can open up to the page that they need and they're not having to 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 go through a you know a book with a lot of writing and try to yeah. figure out what they need it's it's very very easy to use you know i wanted to um to go back to something you mentioned earlier katie and you had mentioned how the the spiritual aspects of this are are so important could you talk more about that well i think we're all spiritual creatures whether we're we're religious or not you know spirituality is more about what's given your life meaning and you know what's been your what what you feel your purpose is, has been you know the reason you get up in the morning and I think that as the body dies, the spirit is still, the, bo- the spirit isn't dying. So I think the spirit needs to be nurtured right up to the end and through the death. So, uh, you know, creating a sacred space where you're dying. And I, I met a woman last week who, who's talking about that. She was really, really, she was really remarkable to me because she was so open about how she wants to die and where she wants the hospital bed and who she wants there and the music that she wants to play. Mm. And she's spending her time now spending time with each of her kids and you know, taking road trips with each of them individually. And to me, that her meaning, a big part of her life is her children. And so she is taking this time to sort of wrap things up with them. And that is her, to me, is her spiritual quest. And with some people, it's religion. They may, they may need someone from their church or temple to, to visit, say prayers. I have a patient who I just met, he, he wanted to be baptized and he said, I have to be baptized as soon as possible. It means so much to me. So we listen again. We listen. What has comforted you spiritually? What, how would you describe your, your spirituality? And with some people, it's being out in nature. And I had a patient who wanted to die out in the woods. And he did die out in the woods. So it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. We, have a, we live in a state that's a death with a dignity state. So... You've had some uh, people that have, you've helped, like that couple that didn't they study with how to, I don't know, they studied, listened to tapes. and Yeah, well, I, I did have a couple who they, they worked with a spiritual guide and they, pre- they prepared um, in a very spiritual way by listening to, to tapes and learning meditation techniques so that when it came his time to die, he, he just left his body with such ease. And his wife felt that she was able to accompany him mm. spiritually wow. to, to, to the moment he left. It's hard to describe because I, I didn't actually do it, but that's how it was explained to me. But they really, really focused on the spiritual aspect of dying. You know, what's interesting to me with this is, you know, in general, people have a really hard time talking about death. I think that in the, because it makes people uncomfortable and because they will tend to shy away or avoid talking about it, it actually creates I think it's almost like a perfect storm yeah. of all of these feelings, this confusion. It, it's ripe for conflict between family members. And really, when you're able to engage in this process and welcome it and invite it and get into relationship with it, it can actually you know, be a beautiful experience. And it doesn't have to be as difficult as, as it can be, as it is for many. Yeah, there's, I think, you know, there's a lot of fear and I think fear is the big thing, fear. And by embracing it, like you say, by, by learning and exploring and being open, the fear just gradually melts away. And then there's that opportunity for all that good stuff. Dying is hard. It's hard work. It's has every emotion imaginable. 
involved in it, but it doesn't have to be that hard. And and I, I find that when families embrace it, when they're involved in it, when they are part of it, they do so much better later when they're grieving. The grief, the grief is much, it's much different. And that when people, you know, shy away from it or avoid it, they much have, they have a much difficult time um, grieving. So it's almost that the way that the family or the caregivers can respond and interact during the dying process has an impact on the grieving process. Yes, I see that all the time. And people tell me later, oh, I'm so glad I did that. It was the best thing I ever did. You know, um, I, you know they have a sense of, such a sense of, of having done a great job for the person they love, just being a part of it and helping mm -hmm. them. It, they, they, it just really, it stays with them forever. And they're changed forever. It, it cannot not change you. Well, that's uh, when, when my dad was in his last, you know, hours, Katie was pointing out to me uh, what was the body was doing, the rash that was on his chest and on his back and around his joints. And she was saying, look, he's doing such a good job. And she was saying to him, my dad's name was Charlie, good job, Charlie. And oh. we all, my mom was there. We all felt like we were accomplishing something, like there was some wow. big event that we were really participating in, and it was great. And, and um, actually... By knowing so much and, and just seeing the kind of the miracle of life, like that's what it was. Yeah. Like birth. Yeah. Like being yeah, at a yeah. birth. It was, it mm -hmm. was amazing because you, you told us exactly what would happen and it did. And it was, and, and then you congratulated us. Oh, and it, good so job. When he, yeah. So when he died, <laughs> we all kind of, it was almost like a, a cheer. What, what, you know, what a, what a great. Well, there is that sense when someone awesome. leaves their body, uh, it, there's just that sense of such awe and, and it is sacred like time stops yeah I also encourage patients don't don't call the funeral home right away like take some time don't because the first few hours being being there after death is, is just such a remarkable time and so I encourage people to take some time and spend you know whether they want to dress, bathe and dress the body um, you know make a toast light some candles you know there are rituals that are very powerful that people can do after after the death. And some people don't know that, that they can keep the body for a while. It may vary from state to state, but but I think you can certainly keep a body for a few hours in most states. And in, in Oregon, you can keep a body up to 24 hours before you have to cool it. And some people keep the body for three days or more, but they have to get dry ice. But that's getting a little technical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that um, that wasn't something I knew, that you don't need to... Um, you know, call uh, the funeral home right away that you can just be with your loved one and take the time to process that moment to yeah. say your goodbyes. I, yeah. But I must say that it's much easier if you have a hospice involved. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, if you don't have hospice in some states, you still have to call the police um, and then they come in and it kind of disrupts the whole atmosphere. So I, I think that if, if you know someone's going to be dying, call hospice. <laughs> Wow, you know, uh, Katie and Yana, this conversation has just been so profound for me, and I, I'm so moved. There was, there was more than a few times when my eyes watered, and I, I'm so thankful to the two of you for for writing this book. It's so needed, and for you know opening the dialogue, and you know letting people know that we can talk about this, and there's a different way to experience this, and there can be purpose and meaning and mm -hmm. wonder and joy. Yeah. Well, thank you for having thank us. Thank you. It's, it's been great really, to really share wonderful. With you. Yeah. <laughs> what is the best way for our listeners to learn more about you, get in touch with you, or buy the book? We have a website that we post blogs on, and uh, it's livingwithdying.com. And it'd be great for readers to write us and um, share their stories because we've been hearing some really remarkable stories. But we, uh, are, it's available on Amazon.com, and it's also a buy button on the Living with Dying, and you can get it in a Kindle version. And we're on Facebook, but yeah, our, our website's really, really fun because we do put in blogs about all different things that aren't in our book, all the kinds of <laughs> okay. topics, uh, so it's really good. <laughs> Again, ladies, thank you so, 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 so much for you know coming onto the podcast today. I'm very excited to share this episode with the world. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Otis. <laughs> thank you. Take, take good care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. 
What a powerful and moving conversation. I learned so much from Katie and Yana and my view of death and the caregiving experience has completely shifted. One of the things that stood out for me is that there is so much to learn from the dying and this time of life, this end of life stage. And that just like the labor in giving birth, there is a labor in dying. And that this labor of death has predictable stages. Another aspect that stood out for me is what it means to have a good death. Another aspect that stood out for me was when Katie mentioned the four phrases, forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you, and their significance at the end of life. And finally, another aspect that really grabbed my attention is how, even at the end of life, how the dying need purpose and meaning. For show notes to today's episode and links to the resources mentioned, please visit www.lordesfiado.com forward slash women in depth. And if you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe on iTunes or share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.